the galaxy is in flames. The Emperor's glorious vision for humanity lies in ruins. His favored son, Horus, has turned from service to the Imperium and embraced chaos. His armies, the mighty and redoubtable Space Marines, are locked in a brutal civil war. Some remain loyal to the Emperor, whilst others have sided with the War Master. Preeminent amongst them, the leaders of their thousand-strong legions are the Primarchs, magnificent superhuman beings. They are the crowning achievement of the Emperor's genetic science. Thrust into battle against one another, victory is uncertain for either side. After seven long years of bitter fighting, Horus has finally reached Terra. Suffering and damnation await all, should the Emperor fall and the war be lost. The end is here. The skies darken. Colossal armies gather. For the fate of the throne world, for the fate of mankind itself. Now there is no way out. The walls have fallen. The gates are breached. And the defenders are slain. This is the end. Plunge into the heart of combat with War Thunder, the premier vehicle combat game available for free on PC and consoles. Take charge of an extensive collection of more than 2,500 military vehicles, including tanks, planes, helicopters, and ships from 10 major nations. Each vehicle in the game is meticulously crafted, including detailed components such as engines, fuel tanks, weapons, and crew, all vulnerable to damage or disablement by enemy attacks. Armor, shells, and missiles have their real-world behaviors, enhancing the authenticity and strategic depth of combat. Experience highly detailed vehicle designs, realistic graphics, and genuine sound effects that put you at the helm of the most powerful war machinery. From the 1920s biplanes and armored vehicles to modern-day fighter jets and main battle tanks. War Thunder features three unique modes, each increasing in realism. Arcade mode is ideal for fast-paced action with boosted vehicle capabilities and easier physics. Simulator mode offers the highest challenge with full realism. Realistic mode provides a balanced experience, combining excitement with authenticity. Whatever your preference, War Thunder has you covered. Join a global community of more than 70 million players for thrilling PvP battles and unrivaled depth of content. Download War Thunder today for free by using the link in the pinned comment or the video description. New players and those who haven't played in six months will also receive a massive bonus pack, including multiple premium vehicles and an exclusive vehicle decorator. Available on PC, PlayStation, and Xbox. During the final stages of the Siege of Terra, the shields of the ship, named the Vengeful Spirit, were down. For some reason, Horus Luprakau's main vessel was unprotected and open for attack. Was this an invitation for a direct confrontation? A trap? A provocation? Whatever it was, the Loyalists knew they had to act. Upon discovering the shields of the vengeful spirit down, Malkador the Sigilite alerted the Emperor, still fighting to keep the Golden Throne and its adjoining webway gate stable. Upon learning of the situation, the Emperor knew it was time to act and end Horus once and for all, even though he was certain it was a trap. The Emperor commanded Rogel Dorn Primarch of the Imperial Fists Legion, and Praetorian of Terra, and Constantin Valdor, the Chief Custodian and Captain General of the Adeptus Custodes, to come with him. Originally Sanguinius, Primarch of the Blood Angels, was to be left behind on Terra, in order to take control of the Loyalist forces 
still defending the palace. But the great angel insisted in joining his father for this pivotal battle. Sanguinius had foreseen the future and had decided that he wanted to challenge fate and defeat his traitorous brother Horus. The Emperor accepted, and thus Sanguinius joined them. Vulcan, Primarch of the Salamanders, stayed behind as a failsafe, designated by the Emperor. Four companies were organized and put together for the assault. The Heteron Guard, led by the Emperor himself. Another Custodes company under the command of Constantin Valdor. A mixed force of Sanguinary Guard and Blood Angels of the First Company, under the command of Sanguinius and the Primarch Rogel Dorn commanding a force of Imperial Fists Huskarls. The operation was codenamed Anabasis. To allow for the Emperor to stand from his throne and buy him time, Malkador took his place on the Golden Throne, an act that he knew would cost him his life. For the psychic powers required to hold the ruinous powers back would eventually be too much for him. For that, the Emperor renamed Malkador the Sigilite to Malkador the Hero. The Old Four, the damned Chaos Gods, had weaponized Horus. All of Chaos was channeled into the War Master. The power of Horus ascended was on an unprecedented level. Even the Emperor of Mankind, with all his might and power, had no victory assured if he faced Horus in single combat. Even more so, with all the power that Horus possessed, it was the War Master who had the advantage over the Emperor. A bold statement, but such were the circumstances in the climax of the Siege of Terror. The four Chaos Gods have prepared gifts for the ones who would come for Horus. The gifts were extravagant, handcrafted, and generous. Gifts made to turn them to Horus's side once they arrived at the Vengeful Spirit. Decay for the great Angel Sanguinius. A rebirth from the mortal wounds of life. A chance for rebirth into a new existence with Horus, his brother, alongside him. United, they would oversee the establishment of a new order in the aftermath of the siege. Blood for Rogel Dorn, a liberation from the stifling order of his regimented mind, a gift to escape where he could finally embrace freedom, fighting as a warrior who acts without the burden of thought, wielding his weapon freely in the heat of battle rather than being shackled to a command room, weighed down by decisions and strategies. The liberation of change for Constantin Valdor, allowing him to renounce the harsh and blinkered strictures of his life as a custodes, and finally become something more than a mere obedient servant, but someone who thinks by his own alert with all the secrets that have been kept from him. And for the Emperor, the greatest gift of all, the reward of pleasure, the permission to finally be what he has always truly been, a god, to relish in godhood, no longer tied to the responsibility or the urge to command. He would finally be able to sit and indulge in power for the sake of power alone, no longer burdened by the heavy load of demands of a 30,000-year plan. These were the traps prepared for the Emperor 
his sons, and the others that would go aboard the vengeful spirit. The Loyalists were going into hell itself, and destiny awaited them. The vengeful spirit at that point during the Siege of Terra was interpolated with the Imperial Palace, and the Impossible City was there too. It was all interconnected by the warp, and an impossible yet real configuration that shifted and flowed on its own. Unrestrained by the established laws of physics, it was an overlapping connection that defied time and space, for time and space had warped so much by that point. Physical barriers were not in place anymore. The warp permeated everything, and no space was safe from it. Not even the deepest places of the Imperial Palace. Reality itself was overlapped with the immaterial realm. The Vengeful Spirit was at that point a main nexus point for warp and real space interactions, with the influence of the four Chaos Gods altering it. The warp was engulfing the entire solar realm like a dense cloud of unreality. So when the companies had teleported into the Vengeful Spirit, they had teleported into a hellish landscape. Once they materialized, they all realized they were scattered aboard the ship. They were in the ship, but at the same time they were not. Back on Terra, the success of Operation Anabasis was uncertain. Terran Command wasn't even sure if they arrived on their intended location, as no confirmation of arrival was ever received. The Emperor and his forces of Adeptus Custodes materialized in what appeared to be a regular hangar inside the ship. It wasn't long until Horus unleashed his vast, dark powers to turn a number of the Custodes against the Emperor. With blood streaming from their eyes and cries echoing from their struggle to resist control, for the Adeptus Custodes to turn against their own will and against the Emperor of Mankind, who they were not only sworn to serve, but genetically built to protect, only goes to show how incredibly powerful Horus Lupercal had become. Many of them fought themselves with every fiber of their being, falling to their knees, choking on their own blood, trying to resist the almost inescapable urge to attack the master of mankind. However many of them did, the Emperor was forced to eliminate dozens of his own custodies before the frenzy finally subsided and he was eventually able to purge the remaining corruption from his warriors. Subsequently, the Emperor and his remaining custodies found themselves engulfed in a nightmarish landscape, with several warriors succumbing to demonic snares. It was then that the Emperor deployed his psychic might, as a bright light to purify the area of its infernal contamination. In the midst of the chaotic battle within the Vengeful Spirit, Valdor and his custodies were severed from the Emperor's side, plunging into a shadowy void swarming with demons. The moment they materialized, they were besieged by an onslaught of demonic entities, their claws, fangs, and talons striking with ferocious speed. From the very first instance of their arrival aboard the Vengeful Spirit, they found themselves engulfed in total darkness and in a relentless attack from the Neverborn. Many custodians died in the very first moments, with many of them being torn to pieces before they even had the chance to fully materialize at their destination. Without warning or quarter given, the fight very quickly turned into a brutal melee. The Adeptus custodies fought on, the blackness was absolute and the demons never stopped coming. As soon as they arrived, it all turned into an endless fight, 
one that took even the mighty and legendary Golden Warriors to the limits of their fighting prowess. The Emperor's finest, killed and killed in the darkness, swinging their weapons, cutting the demons with each lightning strike. But the demons kept coming, materializing in an instant before them, slashing and biting at them with malevolent fury. The custodies kept fighting until all sense of time tracking was lost. There was no time to keep up tabs. There was barely time to react, defend and fight. As soon as one demon fell, another three took their place in the effort to kill the sentinels of the Emperor. Time was dragging on. It seemed to pass on very slowly. Unnaturally slowly. The demons kept materializing and coming at them, and the custodies met them with unwavering resistance. Constantine had lost many men by this point, for what seemed like forever. They had been fighting for an eternity. But in reality, if time even mattered, it had only passed 15 seconds since they arrived. Rogel Dorn, Primarch of the Imperial Fists Legion, found himself in a harrowing situation as part of Horus's trap. Dorn materialized not with his companions, but alone in a seemingly endless sweltering desert. That place was a psychic construct designed to disorient and break him, and the trap was cruel indeed. He was alone, surrounded by the dead bodies of the Imperial Fists, his sons. Dorn started to wander the desert, looking for structures, roads, landmarks, an exit, or anything that he could take into account. But the Red Desert was endless. He continued exploring it anyways. Time passed, and nothing else could be found in that damned place. To keep his head sane, he kept repeating the facts he knew for certain. I am Rogel Dorn, Praetorian of Terra, Primarch of the Seventh Legion Imperial Fists, Seventh Found Son, defiant and unyielding. The phrase was repeated countless times by Rogel Dorn to the hot and empty desert air. A hundred years passed, or more than that. The Primarch was not so sure anymore. Two or three centuries, perhaps, in which time he had walked the length of every wall and trekked the crest of every dune surveying every inch of the boundless waste. There exist barriers, aged walls of stone, their pink hue faded and bleached by relentless light. Insurmountably tall, their purpose eludes him. They neither contain nor exclude anything, simply stretching across the dunes in branching, orderly patterns. His efforts to scale them proved futile. He pressed his ear against them, yearning for any sound from the other side or beyond. Yet nothing could be heard. After years of wandering around, exploring the seemingly endless Red Desert, Marking stones, walls, and ordering patterns together, he came to the conclusion that entry into this place was unattainable, despite him being present within it. That implies the notion to be false. He arrived at that location at some point. He was somehow transported here. There had to be an entry point. Unless his existence had always been bound to the desert. And as the ages go by, this began to seem like the actual reality of the Primarch's existence. 
On certain days, he reached the peak of the tallest dunes. There, as the wind stirred the sand at his feet, he could nearly peer over the barriers. Nearly. Just enough to discern the strange, angular patterns they formed, and to see that beyond them lied only more dunes and more walls. Those were facts. Every day, for what seemed to be an eternity, he ordered the facts he could be certain of. He was there, and no one else was. Fact. He was alone. Fact. His pattern was diverted. Fact. There was not the target principle. The vengeful spirit. Fact. It was a trap. Fact. The desert was endless, and there was no way out. Fact. Days, weeks, months, years, decades, centuries. Yet more time passed. He tried to make sense of the few truths he was able to grasp. He was once a warrior with a singular desire for battle. But they restrained him. They urged him to use his intellect, to take command, to be the one who dissected and understood the situation to put in order the facts, claiming his proficiency in such tasks. They commanded him. But who were they? How long ago was it? Rogel could remember he was in charge of protecting some king, or an emperor, or some figure of high status. He was ordered to protect a big palace and he was in a siege. Or was he? As time passed, he could barely remember that once he had to make thousands and thousands of choices, manage resources, personnel, use stratagems, protect the walls, defend. Yet he yearned not to bear the weight of these choices. The responsibility was eroding him from within. A secret he kept to himself. He longed to relinquish control. To have someone else bear the burden of decision. To have others sort through the facts. His deepest wish was to abandon it all at the walls. To lose himself in combat. Embodying the role of a simple soldier armed with a blade. Just to engage in battle. No contemplation, no resolutions, merely to fight with a liberated, unburdened spirit, as his peers did, to engage in the pure, thought-free act of combat, to relish in the liberation it offered, to be consumed by the primal act of spilling blood. That was his sole, unadulterated desire wishing nothing more than the simplicity of bloodshed. The Primarch Sanguinius and his blood angels were the only ones to have seemingly arrived at their intended destination. Disembarkation Deck 2, aboard the Vengeful Spirit. This didn't make it easier for them, as they quickly faced fierce resistance from the arranged legions of the Sons of Horus and the Word Bearers, along with all sorts of demons. The Blood Angels battled hard inside the main hangar, with Sanguinius fighting and killing every enemy he came to face with the masterful swings and strikes of his weapons, the sword in Carmine and his spear, Telesto. But with all the hasty fighting, the great angel was suddenly trapped in a dark chamber by himself. Sickly black darkness surrounded him. He could hear whispers, continuous whispers that haunted the angel. But he ignored them, 
continuing his path through the darkness, with his sword in carmine ready to strike at any given moment. He followed the flickering shadow of a massive figure in full plate, too large to be an Astartes warrior. Sanguinius was wounded in many places. He tasted blood in his mouth. But he continued on, ignoring his wounds and the pain. He had endured hard-fought battles since the siege had begun. He had fought on the walls of Terra. He had fought and defeated countless traitor legionnaires. He even fought and brought down Titans. He fought and defeated the bloodthirster Carbanda. He fought his traitor brother Angren and defeated him by wrecking his butcher's nails. He defended the Eternity Gate until nothing else could be done and the gigantic gates had to be closed. Sanguinius had endured through all of this to reach this moment of final confrontation with his once beloved brother, Horace Lupercal. But he knew he wouldn't face his brother. Horace was no more. He would have to face someone else, something else. Before facing the new form of Horace Lupercal, he found himself confronted with an image of his dead brother, Pharis Manus. The spirit of the dead Primarch was put in front of the great angel in a display of power by Horus. With his new powers granted by the dark gods, Horus could bend reality and mix the possibilities of the mortal realm with the ones of the immaterial. Bringing the spirit of his dead brother was just a crude but remarkable statement that Horus was able to do unimaginable things. Pharis Manus urged Sanguinius to face Horus before he realized the full extent of his newfound power. To this end he made the great angel see that Horus Lupercal, their brother, was long dead that any shred of doubt he still had about his brother must be eliminated. Sanguinius had to avenge not only Ferris Manus, but his other brothers, even the traitor ones, who were suffering behind their facades and their spirits had gathered to see the confrontation between Sanguinius, the brightest and greatest of them all, against Horus the War Master and Arch Traitor. Kill him for us, brother. Kill him for us and for the damnable things he has done, said Varus Manus. The great angel walked to the next room. Surrounded by the darkness, he made his way deeper and deeper to find Horus. Alert and focused on his task at hand, Within the darkness, demons stood in his path. With every step, Sanguinius killed them. They were like shadows that materialized as sharp claws, pointed tails and sets of fangs. He killed and killed thousands in the darkness, always advancing, one step at a time. Horus Lupercal awaited. There was no way out of the endless place. He knew this, because in the course of centuries he had walked the length of every wall and trekked the crest of every doom, surveying every inch of the boundless waste. There was no way out, except to say it. It wants him to say it, but he won't. He won't give in, even though he felt like that's what he had always really wanted to do. 
he wasn't sure of anything anymore. There were no facts. No data. Nothing he could order. No warriors to command. He was only sure of one thing. I am, he said. He had nearly rusted away. The breeze and sun had bleached the identifier markings from his war gear. He wasn't completely sure of his own name. Whatever he needed to get back to, whatever he had missed, it would have ended long ago. As time marched on, he endlessly reworked his plans, abandoning old ones and formulating new strategies. His continuous, tedious attempts, marked by the dry tones of his self-lectures and the persistent scratching of his blade, eventually silenced the Red's seductive whispers. In their place, different sounds emerged. Faint echoes of conflict and ruin from beyond the wall. He halted, attentively listening, pressing his ear against the solid barrier. The clamor seemed almost within reach, just beyond the wall's confines. The allure of these sounds was strong, yet the wall stood unyielding, just a fraction too tall for him to scale. And he knew that even the summit of the tallest dune wouldn't afford him a view over the edge. The desire to see, to understand, to surrender to the chaos and immerse himself in the unthinking brutality of bloodshed. It gnawed at him. Yet the only path to the other side, to the cacophony of battle he yearned to join, was through conceding to the whisper's demands. The noise of war on the other side of the wall eventually became a palpable roar. Give in. Give up. Just say it. Blood for the blood god. Blood for the blood god. There are no gods, said Rogel Dorn. He leaned close to the wall, his mouth almost touching it. Not even you. On the vengeful spirit, the Emperor came to understand the full magnitude of Horus's true power as he hastened to confront him. He recognized that triumph would be improbable without significantly augmenting his own might. Driven by urgency, the Emperor drank from the warp, consuming its power on a scale unprecedented, amassing all the energy he could muster to challenge the traitor War Master. Eventually, the Emperor's power was such that he started to become a god, the fifth Chaos God or the Dark King, as prophesized by the Eldar race. At this point, even if he was able to beat Horus, he would become the thing he set out to destroy in the first place. However, a perpetual being named Alanius Person faced his own friend, the Emperor persuading him away from the brink of corruption by invoking memories of his humanity. Astonished to meet person there in the vengeful spirit, in that precise moment after millennia, at such a critical juncture, the Emperor stopped for a brief moment to actually have a conversation with his old friend. Person swayed the Emperor to embrace hope and relinquish the immense power he had accumulated. 
even at the risk of jeopardizing humanity's destiny, in a conflict he seemed poised to lose. This pivotal persuasion led the Emperor to cast aside the burgeoning identity of the Dark King, unleashing a surge of released energy that engulfed Terra. While letting go of the vast powers from the warp, the Emperor sent a psychic message to all Loyalists still alive on Terra. Meanwhile, Constantin Valdor continued fighting along his custodies for what seemed to be a very long time. They didn't know how long they had been fighting by that point. Part of the trap set by Horus and the Chaos Gods was to drive the Captain General to torment, to the agonizing realization that he would not be able to fulfill his duty. For the first time in his existence, Constantin Valdor felt a sense of desperation, of anguish, isolated in the middle of the total blackness, unable to fight where he was needed the most, at the side of the Emperor. Yet this did not stop Valdor's killing. He slaughtered his way through innumerable demons. Amidst the pitch black, the only thing they could eventually manage to see was a distant star. Constantin Valdor was sure then that the others could see it too. In the briefest of moments they had between defending and counterattacking, they were able to see it and they fought towards it. The fight was unending, as if time itself had frozen leaving them to fight forever in a never-ending agony. But in the 59th second of the fight, the star that had been guiding them stuttered and went out. The disappearance of the star had another unexpected effect. It released a shockwave that passed through them all, Adeptus custodies and demons alike. The Neverborn disintegrated, but the Custodes felt reinvigorated, as if the shockwave had washed them with new energy. But more importantly, they were able to hear a voice, a familiar voice, a war cry. Those who may hear me, join me now, the voice said. Constantin Valdor took a glance at his remaining companions, as he was sure they heard it too. It was the Emperor calling for them through a psychic message. They advanced towards the call. On the last day of his last year in the desert, the only star that Rogel Dorn could see in the sky went out. He couldn't know, or care, for how long he'd been there, or how many centuries had trickled past. Time seemed to have slipped away from him, like sand through an hourglass, as though all the sand in the entire desert surrounding him had trickled away. Time had taken everything away with it. His purpose. His self. The luster of his armor. Even his name. But when the star went out, it seemed to mean something. Who is the blood for? Just say it. After all that time, he wanted to. It would have been so easy. He wouldn't need a plan then. He wouldn't have to plan anything. It was so very tempting. He thought, in fact, that he could finally say it on that day. What was there to lose anyways? He couldn't remember. 
but it couldn't be much. He was going to say it. But then the star went out. And that seemed to matter. Because very little had changed over the ages he had spent there. The tempting voices, the hisses that have spoken to him, had ceased. Replaced instead by a distant, somehow familiar voice that seemed to ask for help. Perhaps, he thought. That time, he would be able to help the voice. Maybe if he made another plan, it could work. He had made countless other plans by that point. Plans to escape, to find routes outside, but to no avail. Yet despite that, the Primarch started another plan. Marking the wall before him, thinking that perhaps it could work. He marked an X across the wall, and the wall shook slightly when he did so. This is where it will end, this cross here, he said to himself, clawing at the wall at first, and then punching it with force. Then he clawed again and punched it finding the edges of the blocks, his heart racing for the first time in ages. He had found something. He could find a way through the wall. As Rogaldorn clawed his way through the wall, he found himself not in the desert anymore, but in a destroyed city, full of rubble and littered with all the bodies of the Imperial Fists that went with him in the Anabasis operation. The memories flooded back to him as he explored the destroyed city. I am Rogel Dorn, Praetorian of Terra, Primarch of the Seventh Legion Imperial Fists, Seventh Found Son, defiant and unyielding, he said. As he explored further, he found a weapon left behind by one of his Huskarls, and the Primarch of the Imperial Fists swore in that moment to avenge his fallen sons. He then set to follow the call he heard, the familiar voice, the call of the Emperor. Free of all the powers of the warp that he had absorbed, the Emperor was back to being the fully plated golden warrior he had been. Since he stood up from the throne, no longer the mighty entity that was set to become the Dark King. His final confrontation with Horus was ahead, and he advanced, along with Loken, a Luna Wolf space marine that had remained loyal to the Emperor. Litu, a prototype Space Marine Legionary, and Kekaltus, who was a proconsul of the Adeptus Custodes. They advanced into the dark where the Neverborn awaited. With fury and resolve, they made their way through numerous monsters of all shapes and sizes. But the Emperor of Mankind and his warriors were not stopped by this. They fought and killed anything that stood before them in this infernal realm. The Emperor of Mankind and his companions came to a halt, realizing that they had in front of them a company of word-bearers, standing ready in battle formation, waiting just for them. As the Emperor started to advance once again, they dared fire their weapons. But none found their mark. All of the bullets, energy blasts, shells, bolts, and everything that was thrown at him was stopped and disintegrated, dissipated into clouds of flame, meters from their target, by the mine shield the Emperor had just raised. In a masterful display of power, he sent a blast of contained lightning towards the assembled traitor forces, obliterating them 
in a deadly explosion that saw bone, ceramite, iron, and flesh all break and disintegrate. The Emperor and the other three warriors resumed their advance towards Horus. At 64 seconds into the fight, or what has seemed like an eternity, Constantine's company finally encountered foes that weren't demons in the warp. They advanced out of the pitch dark and into the ruins of a city. Hundreds of tags appeared in the helmet displays. The marks were clear to them. They were sons of Horus and word bearers, and they were approaching. His force by this point had been cut down and diminished, but yet some remained, battered but ready to fight. Valdor and his custodes force were determined to find the Emperor, guided by the Nero synergetic signal they could trace. They continued fighting, making their way through the ruins. At 17 minutes and 13 seconds into the fight, Constantine had lost more men fighting against the forces of the Sons of Horus and the fanatical word bearers led by Abaddon. Constantine struggled against the combined forces of the two traitor legions, who fought fiercely to take him and his custodes down. But their efforts were not in vain. As they were keeping these traitors occupied, the Adeptus Custodes were allowing the Emperor to advance on Horus Lupercal. When Sanguinius finally met Horus, it was inside the Lupercal court, part of the vengeful spirit, but magnified into unbelievably vast scales projecting a sense of infiniteness. It was a massive space of long columns, wide arches springing from imposts to create a soaring ribbed ceiling. It is believed that Sanguinius was but a small moat of gold and white and a hugely vast cathedral made of black marble and obsidian. Horus himself was not his brother anymore. Although he had the same face and eyes that Sanguinius remembered, his body was transformed, and the powers of the warp magnified his presence like a massive creature of ancient mythology. The impossibly large figure of Horus loomed like a bestial demigod infused with otherworldly powers. Crackling energy surrounded him as it splashed on the black floor. The traitor war master offered Sanguinius one last chance to join him, to carve a future together, and he even showed the great angel one of five empty thrones showing him that he had been saving a spot for him to face the new future that was coming for all. And Carmine was raised. Sanguinius, the great angel, set himself to flight, defying Horus. The fight between them began. The War Master, despite his bulk, was fast. Faster than any Custodes or any other Primarch, except for Sanguinius. As they fought, the Great Angel attacked and immediately moved out of reach, just in time to re-engage from a different angle, using his wings to go up and down and to the sides, circling, swooping, and making use of the vast space around them to make the best out of his agility. The fight was like that of a wolf versus a raven, or a bear versus an eagle. For Sanguinius, the challenge was delivering a blow, just before rolling 
and moving out of Death's Claws. The Great Angel managed to connect powerful attacks against Horus, but that was because the War Master had let him. As they fought, Horus wished the Great Angel would concede, that he would see the truth of it all, the lies of their father, the inevitable destiny that awaited them all. Horus wished for his brother to join him and turn from the Emperor. That alone would be a sweet victory, to bend the will of this one Primarch. But Sanguinius would not bend. They continued to fight, until Horus realized the Great Angel would not turn to his side. All the strength and power that he was imbued with would be unleashed, as the monster decided to no longer hold back. Horus started to deflect all of Sanguinius's blows, with a strength and speed that were not there before. Or perhaps they were. It was just that Horus had truly unleashed it all, accepting that despite offering everything to his brother, he was just eager to kill him. Fate had ordained payment. Horus and Sanguinius knew from the start how the duel between them would end. But each had a card to play before the prophecy would come true. The dreams had told Sanguinius that he would die the day he faced Horus. Despite this, the Great Angel, instead of staying on Terra with the rest of the defenders, decided to take part in the so-called Operation Anabasis. He wanted to test his fate to defy the odds. But the day came when finally fate had caught up to him. Sanguinius attacked with his sword in Carmine, but Horus evaded the blow with blinding speed. The great angel took to the air once more to change angles and attack again. But he wasn't quick enough. The Talon of Horus closed around Sanguinius' ankle, stopping his flight, and then smashing him to the ground with such force that the deck plates cracked, his right wing broken with a sickening snap. His golden armor cracked and fragmented at various joints and seals. After this tremendous impact, Sanguinius was gravely wounded, and for a second, even unconscious. When his eyes blinked open, pain engulfed him. Broken ribs and the broken wing caused him to wince. The great angel, despite that devastating blow, stood up again in defiance and Horus was surprised that his brother was still able to carry himself, to defy him. Even though Sanguinius moved with incredible speed, Horus ascended, moved at another level, and with a well-placed blow from his weapon World Breaker, he sent his brother flying one last time across the court. Then Horus approached to finish the job, with the Chaos Gods watching in delight. With World Breaker in his hand, he mauled the Great Angel again and again, breaking bones, breaking armor, and tearing apart flesh. He did so until Sanguinius's body was broken, his bones shattered. Then he lifted him, expecting some final words that never came. Blood filled the great angel's mouth and throat. It was in that moment 
that Horus snapped his neck with his claws, and then he dropped him. Sanguinius the Great Angel, Primarch of the Blood Angels, was no more. Bolstered by the powers of the war, and aided by none other than Erebus, Abaddon and his Justerian Terminators began to match the mighty Custodes, even gaining the upper hand over them. As Erebus manipulated the dark magic of chaos to overpower the traitors, outnumbered thirty to one, the Custodes were surrounded by an enemy aided by the powers of the warp, and the warp was thundering all around. The traitors had Valdor and his men in the open, heavily wounded and reduced to almost nothing. A last stand. That was all that was left for Constantine Valdor to do. Hurt the enemy as much as possible before inevitably falling against the overwhelming might that advanced against them. Intent on killing and taking the prize and renown of having killed the Emperor's finest in this darkest hour. And the clash was brutal. Like cornered beasts, the Custodes fought with all their might, suffering wounds that would instantly end the life of a normal man. Suddenly, something, or someone, was seen in the swarming horde of armored traitor Astartes, and it began breaking havoc amongst them. A being with uncontained fury and martial skill like no other had begun to hack a bloody path through the enemies of the Emperor until reaching the encircled Custodes. It was none other than Rogel Dorn, Praetorian of Terra, Primarch of the Seventh Legion Imperial Fists, Seventh Found Son, defiant and unyielding. The melee turned even more violent. The smell of blood in the air permeated all the forces as they clashed with fury. As fragments of armor, bone, and sprays of arterial blood flew upwards and in all directions. Rogel Dorn, Constantine Valdor, and the Custodes, despite their wounds, fought with all their might, punishing the traitor host, determined to make them pay dearly with their lives. As the fight continued on, bodies began to compress against each other, piling atop each other in a thick melee. Another unknown force joined the fray. Predators with sharp teeth, their eyes blackened with fury, braying and charging against their prey. They hit the rear of the traitor armed with such force that the sons of Horus and the word bearers recoiled, astonished and confused. Space Marines wearing red armor, coated in blood, tearing and ripping their enemies apart with a feral fury that was not characteristic of the Astartesian way of fighting. They were hacking the traitors with a brutality never before seen. The Blood Angels of the Anabasis Company, comprising Battle Brothers, Terminators, Sanguinary Guard, all consumed by the Black Rage had just joined the fray, and the insanity of the fight escalated to yet another level. As the gathering storm above them increased in force, the bloody battle increased even more in its intensity, turning the melee into a desperate fight for survival, in which it wasn't clear which side, if any, would emerge victorious. It was then that Rogel Dorn had grabbed Valdor, seizing a short window of opportunity, and they ran together into the heart of the storm, where they assumed the Emperor would be. As the Emperor and his retinue advanced to the hellish landscape that was the vengeful spirit, and overcame a series of obstacles and enemies, they finally arrived to an inner chamber of the ship, where parts of the vessel were visible, while others seemed to belong to other places 
in some other time. When they eventually reached the Lupercal court, the first thing they found, besides the sheer immensity of the hall made of gothic black marble and lit by the glow of bloodlight, was the great angel, Lord of Baal, lifeless and pinned against the far wall by many black spikes, his wings and arms outstretched. Loken and Caecaltus were ordered to take down the body of Sanguinius, and just as they did so, Horus manifested himself before his father in his new, horrifically twisted form. The traitor then attacked the master of mankind with uncontrollable fury and was able to bring him down with a powerful strike bolstered by the ruinous powers. He had him pinned down, but the Emperor's companions intervened. Horus was particularly angry at Loken of the Luna Wolves, who he saw as his son, converted into a servant of the false emperor, but still a son who had turned from him. He had decided to kill them all, including Loken. It was then that the emperor stood up, his golden armor gleaming and his flaming sword raised. The battle between father and son was a clash of epic proportions. It wasn't simply a fight between two mighty warriors wielding legendary weapons. It was a display of power that made everything around them much smaller in scale by comparison. The Emperor's bright psychic will clashed time and time again against Horus's chaos-fueled bloodlight. Both characters moving at inhuman speeds, destroying all around them with the vast amounts of energy unleashed with each passing second. Everything shattered around them, as if the space they were in could not contain their otherworldly powers. Father and son fought in the ultimate duel for mankind's destiny. Each blow so fast that they blurred into pulsing shockwaves that destroyed the plasteel that formed the frame of the ship's compartment, but also the air itself as it was displaced. The light around them as it danced and flickered in and out of existence, and the sound twisted into an acoustic fuzz. As the immaterium covered Terra, multiple realities converged. In one moment, they were fighting in Chthonia, in another, they were in the Himalayan mountains, atop their vast snowy peaks, then suddenly on Istvan V, and then on Molech. It was a fight that was physically taking place in thousands of planes of existence at different times. Eventually, after all ploys, stratagems, and might were spent in their divine duel, Horus had the Emperor of Mankind badly wounded and on the brink of death. Trying to convince the monster that his father had become, Loken explained to Horus how Chaos was only using him as a weapon and that he was not in charge. But during his vain coercion, mysteriously, Olanius' person managed to make his way once again to the side of his old friend and seized the opportunity to give the Emperor a stone knife. A knife so small and crude that it barely fit in his hand. It was the Athame Blade, an ancient weapon. Disregarding Loken, Horus smashed him aside and advanced to finally execute the Emperor. Realizing Horus was advancing and drawing near, Olanius implored the Emperor once more to rise before positioning himself as the Emperor's protector. The master of mankind remained motionless on the ground, declaring his resolve to prevent Horus from reaching the Emperor Olanius discharged his laser gun 
at the advancing, formidable figure of Horus. In response, the War Master disdainfully transformed Ulanius' person into a cloud of red mist with a single swing of his weapon. Without further resistance, Horus finally reached his father once again. Then, with a powerful swing from Worldbreaker, the War Master killed the Emperor. He smashed his father's skull against the black floor and bloodied his mace. The deed was done. As Horus gazed upon the crushed and battered form of his father lying at his feet, uncertainty began to cloud his mind. The act of vanquishing the Emperor brought him no sense of finality or satisfaction. Instead, he found himself increasingly tormented by the insidious whispers of demons and the unsettling pool of the warp, which seemed to feast upon his consciousness. In a final gambit to save Horus from the grip of chaos, Loken pleaded for the War Master to prove himself. Loken appealed to the emotional side of Horus, now that he had just killed the Emperor, to convince him to prove that chaos had no control over him and that he would not be commanded by the ruinous powers. Horus contemplated this realization and concluded that with the war now finished and the Emperor dead, he no longer desired to remain a symbol of terror and that he would not be commanded by the Chaos Gods. That was the essence of the deal he had made anyway. That he was to be in control. He actively rejected the powers and gifts from the Dark Gods and pushed them out of himself. Experiencing some relief as they gradually receded from him, like a sickly black ink being spilled onto the ground. But it was then that the Emperor's trap was made manifest. The broken body of the Master of Mankind started to disintegrate, revealing to Horus that it was only an aspect, an illusion. And when he turned to Loken, the true Emperor was revealed. As the form of Loken vanished, and from it emerged the form of the Emperor, Horus realized he had been deceived, and asked urgently for the powers to come back to him. But the powers were slow to gather, making a window of opportunity that the Emperor did not waste. The two began to duel again, but this time the fight was more even, as Horus was not a god with unlimited power anymore. Powered greatly by the united faith humanity had in him, the Emperor fired a beam of light at Horus. The beam was so powerful that it pinned Horus in place, and the pain he suffered was unbearable. The War Master begged again for the powers to come back, but they were being given back slowly by the gods as a form of punishment for having rejected their gifts. Finally, the wounded Emperor took the crude stone knife into his hand. The Athain Blade, the original weapon with which mankind committed the first murder, and thrust it into Horus's heart. Trespassing plate and flesh alike, and pouring his will into the knife to end Horus once and for all, in a flash of light that absorbed them all. In his final moments, Horus realized that he had been tricked by the ruinous powers. He was nothing more than an instrument of chaos. 
a mere puppet. And for a cold moment, he could see the truth of it all and the betrayal that he had committed. And so, Horus died, honorless and ashamed. The four Chaos Gods began to wail and scream. But with Horus no longer present to serve as their anchor, their presence began to quickly diminish and fade away. Horus was weak. The ruinous powers abandoned the traitor forces as the warp itself began to recede from Terra. Legions of demons vanished, leaving only a trail of black smoke behind and the echo of their screams. The Blood Angels came back to their senses. Gulliman and his vast ultramarine fleet finally arrived, guided by the Astronomicon that was finally lit, bringing retribution with them. The traitor forces broke, suddenly realizing that they had lost. They lost not only the powers of chaos and their gifts, but also their sense of unity and the reason to fight. A victory so certain that was suddenly taken away from them. The loyalists, with the small numbers they had left, began scouring them in a fury of vengeance that lasted for days and dragged on for months and then years to come in what would later be named the Great Scouring. As for the Emperor, his body was too badly wounded after he had killed Horus. So when Rogel Dorn and Constantine Valdor found their way into the Lupercal court and found his agonizing body, they had to teleport the dead body of Sanguinius and the dying Emperor out of the vengeful spirit back to the palace and then carry the master of mankind to the Golden Throne, a device that they knew would be able to sustain him. By that time, Malkador the hero's body had been consumed by flames. Yet, his spirit witnessed the Emperor being carried back into the palace and placed upon the Golden Throne, the place where he belonged, the place where he would spend the next 10,000 years and more. Again, thanks to War Thunder for sponsoring this video. Don't forget to play it for free on PC, PlayStation, and Xbox today by using the link in the pinned comment or the video description below. New and returning players that haven't played in six months will receive a massive bonus pack, including multiple premium vehicles and other goodies. This bonus pack is available for a limited time, so make sure to grab it today. On this channel, we are putting together narrative Total War cinematic battles and Warhammer lore videos. A special thank you goes to our Patreon supporters who help us in the making of more content. You can also join Patreon and earn extra perks while supporting the videos to come. Find the link in the description below. Make sure to subscribe, and thank you for watching. See you on the next one.